So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today is part two of the Jasmine Fiore case. If you haven't caught part one, you kind of need to watch that one before you can watch this one, otherwise this one won't make any sense. I'll link it up here in the eye. I believe it was called the reality show murder or something along those lines. It's linked up here, go watch that one first. But if we're all caught up, then I just want to thank our sponsor for making this video possible before we get into it, Skillshare. If you follow me on my second channel, if you don't, there'll be a link in the description. You'll know that I just moved house and I've moved out of my own home for the first time and now I'm in the process of decorating. And something that's helped me so much through this process is Skillshare. I've watched so many different classes on like styling and interior decorating and just finding my style. Skillshare, if you don't know already, is an online learning community with thousands of different online classes in a range of different subjects from like business and productivity all the way to creative things like photography, video editing, art, and then even just like lifestyle stuff like interior decorating and cooking classes and pretty much everything. The most recent class that I loved was called Style Your Space, Creative Tips and Techniques for Interior Design by Emily Henderson. This class really helped me to identify the style that I wanted with my apartment. It even had like a little quiz in there to help you figure out your own style. I really liked it. And then Emily goes into detail about how you can implement your style into your home and make your decoration a reflection of your personality. I've loved Skillshare classes for so long, especially during the lockdowns and stuff that we've been having in the UK. I've found it so useful to help me feel productive, even though we can't really do much at the moment. I have used it for productivity, but I've also used it for self-care as well. I've watched classes on like journaling and it's really helped me in that way as well. Honestly, Skillshare classes can help you in like every aspect of your life, I swear, from self-care to business, Business, productivity, learning new hobbies and skills. And they're very kindly offering the first 1,000 of you guys to click the link down below in the description, a free trial of premium membership. After that, it's only around $10 a month, but like I said, only 1,000 of you will get this offer. So quick, go down to the link in the description. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the case. I'm just gonna give a little bit of a summary of what happened in part one before we get into part two, just to jog your memory. So Jasmine Fiore was a 28 year old model living in California with her husband, 32 year old Ryan Jenkins. Jasmine and Jenkins had met in March of 2009 in a casino in Las Vegas. And from that moment on, the two of them had this whirlwind romance. They were married literally within three days. They got married in a Las Vegas chapel. Brian Jenkins was a Canadian real estate investor. He was worth like $2.5 million. He was a millionaire that had been on a reality show or just finished recording a reality show for millionaires. It was called Megan Wants a Millionaire. It was like a dating show for this girl called Megan Hauserman to find herself a millionaire boyfriend. Ryan Jenkins didn't win, which meant that he was single in time for him to go to this Vegas casino and meet Jasmine Fiore. They fell in love, they got married. Now the two of them seemed to have the most amazing relationship in the beginning. Like he was rich, she was an it girl. They would throw all these parties on the beach and on boats and they just had the best time together. But then rather suddenly, a couple of months into this relationship, the parties stopped and their relationship suddenly became very, very toxic. Jasmine and Jenkins were both bad for each other. They were both cheating on each other. Jasmine stayed in contact with her ex-boyfriends and would see them regularly. And Jenkins, to retaliate to his wife cheating on him, he would cheat on her, but he would bring these women back to the house and do it in front of Jasmine. And it was just, it was so toxic, literally the meaning of toxic. But this progressed way further than just, you know, arguments, fighting, them cheating on each other. When one day they were at a pool party, Jasmine cheated on Jenkins once again with a random guy that she met at this party and he got physical with her. He pushed her in the pool and she 
pressed charges on him. He had a year of probation. Their marriage was really on the ropes in the summer of 2009. They'd been together, what, like four months and they were already looking at getting an annulment. One thing that was driving a wedge between their relationship was the fact that Jenkins seemed to have no money anymore. Like the party stopped. He stopped spending money on Jasmine. He stopped all of that. And now he paid for nothing anymore. He would say that all of his money is wrapped up in Canadian bank accounts because that's where he's from. Or he couldn't get it converted to dollars. You know, excuse after excuse, he had no money. And he'd actually promised Jasmine $10,000 a month. You know, just as kind of like wife pocket money. I don't know. Pocket money, $10,000. You know what I mean though? He promised his wife $10,000 a month and he was not bringing it and Jasmine was not having this. So Jenkins decided he needed to do something to win his wife back over, like to stop her from leaving him. And so he decided to go on yet another reality TV show called I Love Money. In this, he competed for a quarter of a million dollar grand prize and won it. He took that $250,000 back home to Jasmine and from that point on, their relationship seemed perfect again. Suddenly they were happy, they were all over each other again. It was like they just met each other for the first time. They were going on weekends away, this, this and that. They were so happy. But then something happened that would change all of that. Jasmine Fiore disappeared completely. Jenkins texts around all Jasmine's friends asking if they'd seen her, if they'd heard from her, but no one had. She'd gone out to run errands one night in her car and just never returned home. So Ryan Jenkins got in contact with the police and reported his wife as missing. But as all of this had been going on, police had actually been responding to a completely separate incident miles away that took place that same morning. Around 7 a.m. a man had been walking his dog just outside of LA and he'd walked up to this dumpster, opened it, gone to throw something in, but inside he saw a suitcase and this suitcase seemed to be leaking some kind of fluid. So he pulled it out of the dumpster and tried to get inside of this suitcase and when he did, he found something horrifying. There's a big suitcase, so I took my middle finger and I just lifted up and sure enough, it looks like a body. It's for sure a body? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Inside that suitcase was the beaten up, dead body of a young woman. And the man said that when he'd found that suitcase that day, the fluid that it was leaking seemed to have been this woman's blood. The woman inside was found completely naked. She was curled up in the fetal position and her body had been mutilated. Parts of her were missing entirely. Her teeth had been pulled out, her fingers had been cut off. It seemed as though whoever had done this was removing any possible way of identifying this woman's dead body. So already we have someone trying to cover their tracks. This was absolutely, without a doubt, a murder that someone was trying to get away with. The body was taken for an autopsy and like I say, it was gonna be so, so hard to identify this woman. So that wasn't one of the initial findings. But what was the initial finding was that her cause of death wasn't actually from the bludgeoning and being completely beaten up, which was exactly what it looked like, but her cause of death was actually strangulation. Although she had been severely beaten beforehand, her nose was broken, just every part of her body was just black and blue and covered in blood. But no matter what pathologists did, no matter what techniques they tried to use, DNA, everything like that, they just could not identify this poor victim. That was until one of the pathologists that was carrying out this autopsy noticed some scarring on this woman's breasts. It seemed as though she'd had like a breast augmentation, like a boob job. Upon this realization, the pathologists knew exactly what to do. They opened up this woman, her breasts, and they removed the implant from inside. And luckily for this investigation, 
those breast implants had a serial number on them. And with this, they were able to track down the exact manufacturer of these breast implants, so then they could find out which hospital that exact batch of implants had been given to, and then the hospital could determine which doctor had performed the surgery, and most importantly, which patient this surgery had been performed on. And so finally, with this information, two days after this body was found, so this whole time it had just been in the morgue, unidentified, finally they were able to give a name to this victim. It was 28-year-old Jasmine Fiore. And now this missing persons investigation suddenly turned into a murder inquiry. Who had done this to Jasmine Fiore? Who had beaten her up, strangled her, mutilated her, pulled off parts of her body and then stuffed her in a suitcase and thrown her in the garbage. As with every single murder of any young woman, police look straight to their partner or their ex-partners, ex-boyfriends. Of course, this included Ryan Jenkins. And so they called him up and asked to speak with him. After all, he was the one that reported her missing. So he must have been on the edge of his seat. He must have not been able to sleep for the last few days. However, when police got in contact with him, they actually couldn't locate him. He wasn't answering his phone. He wasn't at home in his LA apartment that he shared with Jasmine Fiore. And so police looked into this a little bit further because they had been speaking with Jenkins for the last few days regarding his wife's disappearance. So they looked into the phone call records that they'd had with Jenkins and they found that the last time they'd been in contact with him was actually that exact morning. Of course, at that point, they hadn't identified this body as Jasmine Fiore, so this was still a missing persons investigation. And they'd asked Ryan Jenkins over the phone if he could come down to the police station, they could ask him some more questions about his missing wife. But on that phone call, Ryan Jenkins said that he couldn't actually do that. He couldn't actually come into the office because he was going back to Canada that day. His visa was about to run out and so he was he was going back home. He was leaving LA, which is horrifically suspicious for police. I mean, it was suspicious in the first place that his wife has gone missing and now he's suddenly leaving the country. But now his wife has been found murdered and he already had a plan to escape the country. At this point, I mean, it was the exact same day that they identified her body and they weren't looking for any other suspects. They were 100% sure that this had to be Ryan Jenkins that had killed his wife. So police put out an alert for Ryan Jenkins' car. You know, they phoned up all the border control of Canada to the US and they said, look out for this car. This man now has a warrant out for his arrest. They knew that he was heading to Canada but police had a theory that he wasn't even gonna stop there because like I said, Jenkins had a very, very wealthy family. He himself, not so much. But his family had properties all over the world. They had land, they had, you know, they had so much, so many different places for him to go on the run. Luckily, police knew exactly where each one of these properties were. So, I mean, they could check them all, but it was a matter of finding him. He was now what police believed to be a very, very dangerous individual. They believed that he'd murdered one woman and tried to cover it up. Who's to say that he wasn't gonna do it again? Police needed to find him very, very quickly. But three days later, they still hadn't found Jenkins. They had no news of him crossing over into the border. He could have already been in Canada at this point, or he could still be in the States. Every single police station in that kind of general area was informed that they were looking for him. There were thousands of officers specifically put on this case within just three days to try and locate this man. Around this same time, Jasmine's white Mercedes was actually found about a mile away from where she lived in her LA apartment with Jenkins. This was the car that Jasmine had supposedly gone out in that night to run errands and then just never returned. That's what Jenkins said anyway. It seemed as though it was just abandoned in a car park. It was literally just left hidden in plain sight. And inside this car, the amount of evidence pertaining to Jasmine's murder was 
incredible. There was blood all over this car, Jasmine's blood. There were clumps of her hair as if her hair had just been pulled out of her head. It seemed as though the attack had, if not fully taken place in this car, it certainly started in this car. There was a high level of violence in this car towards Jasmine Fiore. Police believe it was then later ditched by Ryan Jenkins. You know, they don't think that the attack happened in that car park a mile away from their home. They believe that this happened. And then if Jenkins did kill Fiore, he then drove her car out and just kind of hid it in plain sight. In the car, they also found a letter in the glove box, like a handwritten letter from Ryan Jenkins to Jasmine Fiore, his wife. And while I couldn't find exactly what was written in this letter, I could definitely find the general vibe of the letter. I believe it was like an apology letter or something like that. And it clearly showed the state of their relationship and how tumultuous it is. Police learned a lot from this letter. It was, it was, Proof, it was confirmation that he was angry and violent towards his wife. And now his wife has turned up dead and he's on the run. So it's only further evidence. So by now, police had been able to pinpoint a timeline of events that ran up to the murder, kind of. Of course, the couple attended that charity poker tournament in San Diego. They booked the hotel for the full weekend. They did attend that event together. They were seen there, they were photographed there, they had friends there. And one friend could actually give police the name of the hotel that the couple stayed at. So police went straight down to that hotel in San Diego and asked if they'd seen anything weird, if they'd heard anything weird from the couple. And hotel staff didn't really know anything, but they did offer to give police CCTV footage from outside the couple's room. Of course, they don't have CCTV inside the actual hotel rooms, but they did have it from the corridor outside. So police took it. They looked through it at the police station. And of course, something did come up. On these tapes, you see the couple heading out together at around 2.30 a.m. So I believe this was after the poker tournament, they came back, got changed, and then headed out to the nightclub potentially. But then two hours later, Ryan Jenkins is seen returning to the hotel room alone and he's running. So he runs back to the hotel room and then a little later he's seen coming out of the hotel room again alone. This time he's holding the hotel room phone in his hand. You know, the phone that is provided by the hotel. He's taken it out of the room with him. He goes and gets some ice from the little ice bucket thing at the end of the hotel corridor. And then he returns to the room. The whole time the phone's still in his hand. But he's not on the phone. He's just like holding it by his side. Jasmine doesn't return to the hotel room at all on this CCTV footage. Not that night, not the next morning. And then at 9.30 a.m. the following morning, so technically the same day because half of this was happening at like 5 a.m. At 9.30, Ryan Jenkins leaves the hotel room for the last time and goes and checks out. There's no sign of Jasmine Fiore this whole time. But what police were very interested to find out was that there was actually two entrances to their hotel room. They had the one entrance through the hotel that this CCTV was catching, but they also had an outside entrance. They had like patio doors on their hotel room. So there was a way to get in that didn't have cameras. So there's no way of knowing if or when Jasmine returned to the hotel room that night, what the circumstances were. Police theorize that Jasmine did actually return to the hotel room that night, but through the outside door. They believe at this point, the attack had already begun. They think that an argument sparked in Jasmine's car when the couple were in there. And that is where Ryan Jenkins began beating Jasmine Fiore. After that, they believe that Jasmine was so weak and so injured that she could barely walk. And so Ryan Jenkins didn't want to take her through the main entrance of the hotel, through all the corridors, just in case someone saw her. And so they believe he kind of carried her to the patio door 
and then realised he couldn't actually open the patio door from the outside. So he leaves her on the floor outside their hotel room by herself, weak, bleeding, as he runs inside the hotel, runs past the cameras and into their room. So that would explain why... He was running through the hotel at five in the morning. They then believe he brought Jasmine in from outside and that was when this attack just snowballed. And there is physical evidence to back up this theory because police went out onto the patio outside that hotel room and they found spots of blood on the ground and it was later found to be Jasmine Fiore's blood. They also once again found clumps of hair, strands of Jasmine's hair, as if her hair had been pulled out or as if she'd been dragged by her hair. Going back to the middle of the attack, actually, when Ryan Jenkins is seen leaving the hotel room with the phone set in his hand, this would explain why. If Jasmine is still inside that hotel room, beaten but still alive he wouldn't want her to call for help he wouldn't want her to call 911 or call a friend to come and get her or he just wouldn't want her saying anything so that explains why maybe he took the phone out of the room when he went to get ice but why was he getting ice was it for himself or was it for jasmine a lot of people have looked at this and theorized that maybe Ryan Jenkins realized what he'd done and how brutal he'd been. And maybe it freaked him out because he realized that he'd gone past a point that he'd ever gone before and he was gonna be in serious trouble for literally beating up his wife. So a lot of people think that this was Ryan Jenkins' attempt at apologizing, going to get her some ice to take away some of the pain that he just inflicted on her. Obviously, there were quite a few hours of the couple just being in the hotel room. If this theory is correct, that means they entered the hotel room around 5 a.m. and Ryan Jenkins didn't check out until 9.30 a.m. It's believed that Jasmine was already dead at 9.30 a.m. But at what point in that four and a half hour gap was she killed? Psychologists believe that at least an hour probably two of that time was spent Ryan Jenkins apologizing and begging Jasmine Fiore to not call anyone and to not, you know, press charges. But they believe that Jasmine, you know, she was standing up for herself. She was saying, no, of course I'm gonna call the police. Of course I'm gonna, you know, tell people that you've done this to me. And they believe that once Ryan Jenkins realized that he wasn't gonna get away with this, he knew he had to silence Jasmine. And then at some point before 9.30 a.m., he decides to strangle her to death. And then he begins mutilating her body and stuffing her into her own suitcase. We never actually see him leave the hotel room with the suitcase. So it's believed that he took it out of the back entrance. And then he gets in the car that still had all the blood and all the hair in and then he drives off to go and dispose of Jasmine's body. So anyway, time is going by in this case and police still can't find Ryan Jenkins anywhere. It's been like five days at this point and more and more information is being revealed to police about their relationship and about Jasmine's murder and every single hour that goes by, police have more and more reason to believe that this was Ryan Jenkins. I mean, they were fully convinced. They couldn't be more sure that it was Ryan Jenkins that murdered Jasmine Fiore. And so on August 20th, five days after her disappearance, they charged him with her murder. Without him even being there, without him being arrested, without them even having to see him in person, they charged him with murder. Meaning no matter what happened when they found him, he was 100% going to face trial. They didn't even need to question him, interview him, arrest him, nothing. On site, he is charged with her murder. Which is something I've never, in all of the cases that I've covered, I've never heard of police doing that before. I've never heard of police being so sure of a suspect that they don't even need to question them. They've just already charged them without even seeing them. But right now in this case, Ryan Jenkins is dangerous 
and he's on the loose. Police have no idea where he is. That was until August 23rd, a full eight days after Jasmine's body was found. In this eight days that Jenkins had kind of been on the run, there'd been so many believed sightings of him, of his car. There were even some people that contacted police saying they thought they'd seen him driving a boat. None of these were really confirmed. Um, police were just really confused at this point. They were getting so many different inputs from so many different people. They had no idea where he could be. They had no idea what to believe. That was until police in British Columbia in Canada received a particular phone call. This phone call was from a man that owned a local motel named the Thunderbird Motel. And he called police to say that he had just found a dead body in one of his motel rooms. This man said that the motel room where he found this dead body had actually been paid for three days prior by an attractive young woman. She paid for three days up front and one of the people in another motel room actually watched her enter her room, which was room number two, with a man. They said that the woman was in there for about 20 minutes and then she left. The man never left, so they believed that the man, like maybe the room was for the man. Like I said, she paid three days up front and now was three days later. It was the end of that three days, but the motel owner hadn't received the keys back. The person that was in room number two hadn't checked out. And so he decided to go and knock on the door, see if everything was okay and, you know, kick these people out if they weren't gonna pay. So he went and knocked on the door and no one answered. So he went to push the door open a little bit. He pushed it open a crack and just said, are you okay in there? No response. So he pushed the door open a little bit further and that was when he discovered a dead body in this motel room. And this body was that of Ryan Jenkins. He'd committed suicide in that motel room, hanging himself from a clothing rack with his own belt. It's unclear how long he'd actually been dead in that hotel room for, if he'd killed himself on the first day, or if he'd been sat in that hotel room thinking about his life and what he'd done for three whole days before finally doing this. There wasn't necessarily a suicide note found in the room. Well, there was nothing really found in the room. However, on Ryan Jenkins' laptop, police actually found a document that was titled Last Will and Testament, which, you know, you would think is his will, but it was a lot more informal and it kind of was like a suicide note. It was kind of just talking about his life and where things went wrong. He said in this note that he blamed Jasmine Fiore for always making him jealous, you know, sleeping with her ex-boyfriends, kissing boys at parties and things like that. He said that he blamed her for his emotions and his actions in the last few months. But in this note, no matter how much he talks about Jasmine Fiore, he doesn't mention once anything about her murder, her disappearance. There's no mention of her loss in his life. Like he's not upset about losing his wife. He doesn't say anything like that. And we know that he actually knew that she was found, that her body was found because his father called him to say that Jasmine had been found murdered. So he knew that police had found the body. That was probably why he did this because he knew that they'd be on to him by now. But still, there was no mention at all of his beloved wife's untimely death. So there was also no mention of him being responsible at all. There was no confession, literally no hint to anything at all. So police looked further into this, you know, like how it had got to this point, how we'd got to Canada, stuff like that. They also looked into who was that woman that checked him into the motel and they believe it to be his half sister. Again, it's not confirmed exactly what she knew about this whole thing. Did she know that her brother was a murderer and was she intentionally trying to help him run away? Or was she completely clueless? Had her brother just come to her in Canada for the first time in six months and said, oh my God, I really need a motel. Will you pay for it for me? And maybe she was just being a good sister. Who knows? I couldn't find any 
information as to like a charge you know if she'd been charged with being an accessory to murder or or anything maybe the police do believe that she's entirely innocent and that she just kind of got swept up in this and she had no idea what was going on when she paid for that motel room so there's really not much closure in this case at all there's there's no justice that can be served because the person that so brutally took her life took his own so that he wouldn't have to pay for what he did. But what was Ryan Jenkins' motive? I mean, I'm sure you've all probably guessed by now that it was his extreme jealousy and his power complex and everything. He believed that Jasmine was his property. But what was it specifically on that night that made him snap and lead to murder? Because as far as everyone in their lives was aware, they were the best they'd ever been. They were all over each other at the dinner table. They were throwing parties again. They were posting videos on MySpace, all loved up. So this seemingly came out of nowhere. Well, police actually managed to get a hold of Jasmine Fiore's mobile phone history. I don't know if they ever actually found her mobile phone, but at least they could access her history and her text message history from that night. They could read the text that she was sending and receiving. And on there, they found a lot of evidence that Jasmine was clearly very uncomfortable and maybe even scared that night. She was trying to get away from Ryan Jenkins. So this was the night of the poker tournament, the charity poker match thing, and Jasmine had been on her phone all night texting her ex-boyfriend, Robert Hasman. Remember the one that was like her soulmate, the one that she always saw herself ending up with? They were on and off, but they would always find their way back to each other. She was texting him all night. She was begging him, she was begging Hasman to come and get her. She was saying she didn't feel comfortable, she didn't wanna be with Jenkins anymore, and she just wanted to leave. She was saying in these texts, please will you just send the private jet to come and pick me up because I don't wanna be here anymore and me and you can just like go off somewhere in his private jet. So police theorized that this could have been Jenkins trigger that night. Maybe he found out that she was texting her ex again and that she wanted to leave him and she wanted to go off with this guy that was way richer than him. And they think this triggered his jealousy once again, that this guy has everything that Jenkins doesn't have. Jenkins doesn't have the money and he doesn't have a private jet and his wife would rather be with this man that has it all. It still doesn't make full entire sense to me. I mean, this is the believed theory, but I mean, he watched his wife cheat on him. Like he watched her kiss other men in front of him and he knew that she'd slept with her ex-boyfriends before, like while they were married. So why were a bunch of texts his breaking point? I believe that there, there has to be something more to it. A lot of people believe that that's just it though, that that's just, that, that was just it. And he just was very easily triggered that night. I, of course, we don't know. Police believe that he found out about these texts to Robert Hasman in the car on the way home from the poker tournament. And that was when he attacked Jasmine Fiore in her car as they were driving back to the hotel. And then that was when he dragged her body back inside the hotel room to finish her off. Police also found out that after Jenkins had done all of this, after he'd murdered Jasmine, mutilated her, shoved her body in a suitcase and then thrown that suitcase in a dumpster. He then went back home with her mobile phone and his and he began texting himself off her phone. So it looked like she was still alive. She was still talking to him as normal. He was texting himself off Jasmine's phone saying things like, oh, I'm gonna go out to lunch in Santa Barbara with some friends today and then I'm gonna go get my nails done. So I might be late home tonight. He's literally trying to cover his tracks a couple of hours after he committed the murder, he's trying to cover his tracks, give himself an alibi, so that when he went to the police and said, oh my God, my girlfriend's gone missing when she was running errands, they'll be able to look at his phone and see that she seemed to have been running errands that day when she went missing. Of course, it didn't work, but... So as the news broke of this horrific crime, you know, Jasmine Fiore's body has been found, this, this supermodel, this woman that everyone admired, you know, women wanted to be her, men wanted to be with her. Everyone loved Jasmine Fiore. 
And the news broke that she was found murdered. And then very shortly after that, the news broke that the person that murdered her was beloved reality star Ryan Jenkins from Megan Wants a Millionaire. Of course, this is the absolute worst publicity for Megan Wants a Millionaire that you could possibly imagine. Having a murderer on the show that murdered his wife. And so VH1 immediately pulled the show. Only three episodes had aired at this point, literally just three, and they pulled it all no one's ever seen the rest of it. Of course, I Love Money, the show that Ryan Jenkins was in and won, that never aired either. You know, people didn't even know that Jenkins won for a very long time until someone actually leaked that information. Megan Hauserman from Megan Wants a Millionaire actually stayed silent on this whole case for a very long time. And I mean, I don't blame her. I bet it's absolutely terrifying to know that a man that you were interested in and that you had a connection with and you were going to pick as the winner for your show and you were gonna start a relationship with that he is capable of, of insane violence and murder against women. I bet that was traumatizing for her to even think about. She never wanted to give interviews or anything like that until eventually years and years later, she finally gave her first interview in which she said that there were a bunch of red flags about Ryan Jenkins that she didn't realize at the time, but now looking back, they were definitely red flags. She ignored them at the time because he was so charming and after all, it was just a reality show. So like, you know, maybe it was a bit weird, but that's the whole point of the show is to be, you know, interesting <laughs> and dramatic. But she said that, you know, she obviously had this connection with him through the filming and so, Outside of filming hours, she would go back to her hotel and she actually sent Ryan Jenkins a friend request on Facebook so that they could talk out of filming hours. Now this isn't really allowed. It definitely wouldn't be allowed these days, but you know, they started talking outside of the show. She said that they would message each other for hours every single night after filming wrapped and she really, really liked him but he seemed to really, really, really like her. He was saying things like, I can imagine my life with you. Like, I wanna be with you for the rest of my life. Bear in mind, <laughs> they've known each other for like two weeks on a reality show of all things. They literally went on fake dates every single week. Fake dates with cameras in front of them. It was all being orchestrated by producers and things like that. But he seemed to genuinely be in love with her. And Megan kind of liked it because she kind of liked him. Right in the beginning, Megan said that she was actually gonna choose Ryan Jenkins to win Megan Wants a Millionaire. And he was gonna be her boyfriend when they finished filming. However, as time went on, these messages were weirding her out a little bit, but at the same time she was flattered and you know, she told the producers, she was like, look, I think I'm gonna pick this guy to win. And they said, don't do that. <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't say don't do that, but they, they sat her down and they kind of spoke to her and they said, look, we wanna do this show for three seasons. This is the first season of Megan Wants a Millionaire. We've signed a contract for three seasons and Ryan Jenkins is not exactly the fan favorite right now. And basically they wanted her to pick someone that the public would like. They wanted her to end up with someone that the public wanted her to end up with so that people were happy with the ending of the show and they would come back for a season two. And they said, Ryan Jenkins ain't it. So it wasn't like they forced her not to pick him, but she eventually decided, you know, for the sake of the show, I'm gonna pick someone else. But then after the show, she was gonna get in contact with Jenkins again and say, look, I'm sorry, you know, I did it for the show, but I actually wanna be with you. But by then, when she got back in touch with him after the show, she called him and he was like, oh, um, yeah, I got married like two days ago. And she was like, what, <laughs> what? You were telling me you saw a future with me two weeks ago and now you're married? to a woman that you met three days ago. But anyway, luckily for Megan Hauserman, that was where that relationship ended with Ryan Jenkins. Also, this is slightly unrelated, and I've briefly covered this at points in the case, but it also came out later on that Ryan Jenkins, you probably guessed it, 
was not a millionaire. He scammed his whole personality. He said that he was worth $2.5 million. He was on freaking Megan wants a millionaire. And he was not a millionaire. His money wasn't tied up in Canada. He wasn't having issues converting it to dollars. He just didn't have it. He didn't have money. The reason that he was able to throw parties at the start, you know, when him and Jasmine first got together, he was a big spender. He spent a lot in casinos. He threw these beach cabana parties, but that was actually all his family's money. His family was rich. He <laughs> didn't earn a penny. He didn't have a job. He didn't have an income. He didn't have literally like anything. His family owned so much, so much property, so much real estate, so much freaking business and he had nothing. He had so much anxiety and stress over money in his life. And like one week he would have a lot of money and then the next week he would have absolutely nothing. And I think this all contributed to his insecurity in his relationship with Jasmine Fiore because that was really all he had going for him was the fact that he had a lot of money. <laughs> and he didn't even have that. But like, that was what he used to get women. He was like, I can take care of you. I can give you $10,000 a month. I can buy you this. I can take you there. But he couldn't even do that. And Jasmine being, you know, the celebrity that she was, she'd been with rich men before. Robert Hasman had a freaking private jet. And I think Ryan Jenkins just felt very inferior to all of Jasmine's ex-boyfriends that she was clearly still in contact with. But yeah, I just kind of wanted to straighten that out at the end because I said so many times that he was a millionaire, he was worth this, this and that. That's just the story that he told people. And we only found out that he wasn't a millionaire once this whole thing had come out and both him and Jasmine were gone. So in the aftermath of this murder, there was absolute outrage from the public at how this man who was clearly very narcissistic to a dangerous degree, to the point where he was committing severe violence and murder. People were just outraged at how he managed to get on these shows, on dating shows. Literally VH1 were giving him access or a platform or the opportunity to meet a woman. That does not look good for VH1. The fact that they managed to get this violent man on a dating show. And he was on two as well. It wasn't just one that he slipped through the cracks on, it was two. Megan wants a millionaire, I love money. How did this man get through background checks? How? Because background checks were run on him. He did have background checks, that's the thing. But they just didn't find all of these things, all these concerning traits. And not only that, it was later revealed that he actually had a previous criminal record for violence against women. But somehow these background checks, they didn't find that. And somehow he was just put on the show. In 2007, Ryan Jenkins was arrested for domestic violence against his then girlfriend. For this, he was given a year of probation and he was put through therapy and counseling and stuff to try to target the root of why this happened so that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Obviously not very successful. But how did these background checks not find that he had a criminal record? Surely that's the most important thing that a background check is supposed to do. Well, it turns out that Viacom, so these are the big people behind these reality shows, Megan Wants a Millionaire, I Love Money, they use the same company for every single background check that they do on their contestants. And this is through a company called Collective Intelligence. But the problem was, Collective Intelligence is a US company that only does US citizen background checks. And Ryan Jenkins was not a US citizen, he was a Canadian citizen. So Collective Intelligence, Viacom still gave them this, this work. They said, you know, I know he's not a US citizen, but find someone to do it for us, please. And so, Collective Intelligence outsourced Ryan Jenkins' background check to a Canadian company called Straight Line International. So Straight Line International run the checks and they come back and they say, all good, he's good to go, no issues here. Which is just insane that they were able to do that. But anyway, this company, Straight Line International, that somehow brought back this, this all good report on Ryan Jenkins, they were looked into 
And it was found that they just didn't even do it. They didn't even do the check. They didn't even look him up on, you know, criminal history database, whatever it is. They just didn't do it. They just didn't do it. And they just went back to collective intelligence and they just said, yeah, fine, let him on. Of course, they've been sued left, right and centre for this because that's so dangerous. Clearly, so bloody dangerous. I think they were sued by VH1 or Viacom. They were also sued by Collective Intelligence because, you know, it made them look so bad that they'd outsourced to Straight Line International and somehow they mess it up so bad. This then looks bad on Collective Intelligence. It's all a big mess. But that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Remember the first 1,000 of you guys to click the link down below in the description gets one month free of premium membership. And trust me, it's worth it. So go down there, click the link in the description. Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up on this video. That would really help me out. If you wanna subscribe, you can subscribe right here using this link. If you wanna subscribe to my second channel, you can click this link over here. There'll be some fun stuff coming on there very soon. And if you want to watch another video, another true crime video, then there's a playlist on screen right now.